Hello, dear Africa, dear all. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you to today's session, which is a very special one indeed, because we have a very special person in class. Uh, today is May the 6th, 2020, and uh, I'm happy to welcome all our students from Nigeria, from Ghana, from Democratic Republic of Congo, and from Burundi. I welcome all the super professors who are already seated, uh, who are our facilitators, our great vice chancellors, and uh, all the others. As I said, today is special, and uh, I would like to uh, share with us what our program looks like for the day. So, our program for today, 6th of May 2020, looks like this. Uh, I'm already giving you a welcome, uh, after which I will introduce and request our special guest of honor uh, to give her remarks. And as you are aware, our special guest of honor is no other than Her Excellency Professor Jane Nana Opoku Ajemang, who uh, is former Honorable Minister of Education of Ghana. It was only like yesterday that I sent a mail to her and I asked if she would be kind enough. She's a very, very busy person, as you will see when I introduce her. If you'd be kind enough to give us and be our special guest of honor today. And with, within a second, I will say, she responded and said, oh, yes, she would like to be here. Uh, I'm quite, uh, we're quite honored, and I'm quite appreciative of your kindness in uh, being our special guest of honor today. Uh, after opening remarks, there'll be a live lecture, number one, on emerging trends in the world of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics in Africa, and the rest of the world. That will be for 40 minutes, and there'll be question and answer thereafter. Uh, and then we're going to have recent developments in STEM education, in Ghana. This will be given by no other than Professor Jofos Anama Mensa. So it's now my pleasure to welcome our special guest of honor. And who is our special guest of honor? She is Professor Opoku Ajeman, who taught and worked at the University of Cape Coast starting 1986. She has held various academic positions, including head of the Department of English, Dean of Faculty of Arts, and all of this, all of these wonderful positions, which we're preparing her for high office. From 2008 to 2012, she was the vice chancellor of this great university. And it's on record because I quiet, I kept going there uh, to the University of Cape Coast uh, because my friend and brother, Professor Jufus Anana Mensa, it was there as co vice chancellor. And we saw giant strides, giant developments when she was vice chancellor. As I said, God was pre preparing her for greater height. In March 20, 2007, she was one of the five scholars selected to deliver presentations during the 200th anniversary of the abolition of slavery at the UN headquarters in New York. October 2009, she was elected Ghana's representative to the executive board of the United of UNESCO. Ahead of 2012 general elections, she moderated the debate with Kojo Okpon Nkrumah. Between 2013 and July 2017, she served as the Education Minister of Ghana. I must let her know that uh, uh, the President John Mahama is my is a very good friend because I am uh, Baba Basanjo's man, and uh, John Mahama is a uh, close associate. So we are all of those presidents. I interact with uh, President John Mahama so much uh, that on a number of occasions, uh, that's the Vice Chancellor of Investment Bank coming in. She, yeah, the, the President Mama told me how wonderful she performed as Honorable Minister of Education in Ghana. October 26, 2018, she became Chancellor of Women's University in Africa, located in Zimbabwe. She has served on many local and international boards and committees, such as the Center for Democratic Governance in Ghana, Etra Board of the, and several others. If I start talking about Professor Jane Opoku Ajeman today, uh, it will take the rest of the day. So it's my pleasure, ladies and gentlemen, 
to invite our uh, and by the way uh, you all you, you have all seen twice now the video we showed just a snippet of our contribution to education in ghana uh, staring towards term education just a snippet of it in that uh, 40 minute video that i showed to you so my pleasure to invite her a uh, special guest of honor to give us a few uh, remarks over to you ma'am so good morning to everyone participants facilitators friends colleagues Rosanna Moments, a good morning. And of course, a big thank you to the eminent Professor Peter Okebu Kola. Prof, thank you for your kind invitation and for your continued trust in the small things that I'm blessed to do. Thank you. I thank you for the kind invitation. Whatever that is good, I give thanks to God. He's been my friend and my support all my life. Amen. You know, uh, as dean of graduate studies, especially then going on to become vice chancellor and then minister, I try to push hard to provide support for STEM. Yes. I try to strengthen the systems we saw and create new ones because I thought that was the way to go. And my feel at this time is that it is not so much the money, it is not so much the equipment, it is now time for us to think of new strategies. Yes. New strategies to realize the importance and especially the relevance of STEM. Yes. My feel is that one way is to make it very true to our lives. Hmm. If science is universal, then it means it's everywhere. Sure. And I, as somebody in literature and in language, you know, sometimes I'm very interested in the use of words. For example, when we say something is scientific, what do we mean? Hmm. What images come into our mind? Do we see ourselves there? We have called uh, and uh, we received, or oh, let me put it this way, we put so much emphasis on, on investment, which is important. We have isolated science students and giving them preferential treatment. We've done the whole work. So why does the number not grow? Wow. What is the problem? And I think we need to we need to face this issue and come with, with real, real solutions. For example, we have made science compulsory. We have provided we prioritize science students. Today we are talking about STEM. There are other disciplines we need to be worried about. But my feel is that because we have isolated STEM from everything else, and because we have not localized it, it's universal. Yes. So it is around all of us. Hmm. So why, why is it that it is not happening? We see the poverty of women in science. And I'm always amazed by that. Because I ask myself, how did science become male-dominated? Frankly, I don't see it that way. I don't see it that way because what do women do in our culture? Do they, you know, do they process food? Do they extract oil from nuts? Is this not science? What is science? Where, you know, where does mathematics play a more central role than in our market? Where is it in our syllabi? We love football. The football pitch itself is a huge mathematical construct. Sure. And every land, everything about football is math. You know, from the number of players, the quarter, but I mean, name it. So all I'm saying is that we need a new strategy. We need to put science in everything we do. Right. We, you know, we need to move away from the thinking that science is away from us. So that when it comes to equipment, it comes to specimen, it comes to reagents, it comes to theories, even comes to references or language, then it's all coming from external sources. How do we expect to to convince anybody that this is so important. Who are our scientists? Who calls them? Hmm. We always saw every reference Einstein is. So with all respect, I'm not saying that what they have done is not important. Yes. But what I'm saying is that what do we have that we should grow from? Today we are threatened by an illness. We have seen the discovery in Madagascar. How have our scientists how how, how have our scientists reacted to this? Are we all? Are they also waiting for all of us to receive a vaccine, a vaccine developed mm -hmm. from others, so that we can spend scarce national resources wow. purchasing them and therefore 
deepening our dependency. Wow. STEM is not magic. Sure. Everyone can learn it. Society needs it, its benefit. We need to highlight science and math in every discipline. Hmm. Math is in psychology, it's in language, it's in literature, it's in music, drama, sports, it's in history, it's wow. in the creative arts. It is very, very central to debate. Wow. So all I'm saying is that let us bring the science home. It is around us already. Sure. The mathematics we use every day. We shouldn't grow up to realize that, oh, but this was so simple, this was so interesting. So what took us off? So to end, I'll say that we need to emphasize two things. The conception itself, hmm. the methodology, yeah. and if I may add a third, its application. Yeah, okay. And of course, to sum all of this, the recognition that we are using science every day. Yeah. It should be in our studies, it should be emphasized. So that even the governments themselves will see that they need to put more than the percentage that AU is asking for to support science. Thank you very much. I know I've taken more than two minutes. Oh, no, I'm it's sorry. just fine. Thank it's just fine, Rule Minister. I mean, those are profound words. Those are profound recommendations which uh, our group will uh, put together as we summarize. You can see we are all, I know I've muted you, all the others. Please just clap for our excellency. This is just very, very moving. <laughs> And uh, it will form a matter for discussion and for explication in the coming uh, days. Oro Minister Ma, may God continue to bless you. You said it just now that you you, had, you that you rest all your successes and you give him all the glory uh, to God. So that same God will continue to take you to very great heights. Thank you once again. Thank you very much. Lesson. Thank you. So we will now you. press on with uh, our first lecture, and uh, uh, that lecture is going to be given by somebody called Peter Okebukola. Uh, just uh, uh, give me a minute to get set for it. So after that remarks by uh, Oral Minister of Education of Ghana, what else can I say? But you see, I have this uh, task of uh, sharing with you uh, emerging trends in the world of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics in Africa and the rest of the world. Uh, what I intend doing is uh, to take science, technology, engineering, and mathematics as one because they are like brothers and sisters. And I'm going to be targeting their impact, the trends with regard to revolutions, industrial revolutions in the world, and also as it relates to our great Africa. While I was in school, secondary school, we read this book by George Orwell. Uh, 1984. You see, that book was written by this man, Eric Arthur Blair, who came under the name George Orwell in 1949. So it was looking at 1984, looking far ahead. And I tell you, all that he predicted for 1984 came to pass. Unfortunately, uh, he died uh, in 1950. He died a year after writing the book at the age of 46. But what happened was, we read the book and we kept uh, looking ahead. We found that all that George Orwell predicted came to pass. So what I tend doing, ladies and gentlemen, is to take a look back from what we regarded now as the first industrial revolution. As I said, I'm looking at STEM. I'm not breaking them down into science, emerging trends, technology, emerging trends, engineering, because they are brothers and sisters. I have collapsed them all into one, and I'm looking at how they have the trends in influencing revolution, industrial revolution in this case, in the world. So, when I hear that word industrial revolution, when I was growing up, more or less, I kept wondering, what's this industrial revolution? So the question that comes to my mind that I want to uh, rub with you is what is an industrial revolution? Ladies and gentlemen, we can take an industrial revolution to be a rapid change in industrial activities as a result of shift from handmade, which will yield fewer products, to machine made, which will lead to mass production. So that now takes us to what has been regarded as the first industrial revolution. You know, you are the best PhD students in the whole of Africa, and they should know many things beyond your area of specialization. So somebody asks, uh, which revolution, which age are we in, or which of the revolutions are we in? So please note that the first industrial revolution started in Britain in the 18th century. And I'm sure I'm not insulting your knowledge by saying that the 16, when you write 1621, 
That's the seventeenth century. That means you add one to it. Seventeen. When you say seventeen eighty two, that is the nineteenth century. Seventeen is nineteenth century. So by implication, this is twenty twenty. We are now in the twenty first century. So you can see how far back it is. Eighteenth century. Now the agricultural societies then became industrialized and urbanized. And what happened was, ladies and gentlemen, we had inventions like the ones you can see on my right here. And that first industrial revolution was characterized by textiles, steam power, iron making, and there were several machine tools that were invented. And so that led to a transformation of economies. And because people agree, blows out. Industries blows up. And industries became more productive and efficient. It also impacted negatively on the environment. Indeed, it's still subsisting now. Uh, Professor Michael uh, uh, Ahove is in the house. I saw Professor Michael also come in. Welcome, sir. Professor Michael Ahove is the great environmentalist. The whole thing started during this, this abuse of the environment started during the uh, Industrial Revolution. It impacted negatively on the environment. Uh, because population increased, there was depletion of natural resources, and uh, burning of fossil fuels led to increased air and water pollution and all of that. So the question you want to ask me, because we're looking at trends, we're looking at Africa, we're looking at global. So during that period, what was happening in Africa, my dear colleagues, my dear compatriots? Uh, now, in Africa at that time, we just continued to have, have peasant farming. You know, in Europe and North America, they were having industrialized farming, mechanized farming. Ours was still peasant, peasant farming. Slave trading was on. You see, the white people wanted people uh, to work uh, to work in the in the plantations and the farms, so they had to get some slaves from Africa, which took 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 them. So don't be deceived when you hear people say there was no technology in Africa in those days. There was technology. Uh, rudimentary technology, you will say. There was mathematics. Rudimentary mathematics. You could hear a minister talk about mathematics and everything that we do. There was science, although you can label it pseudoscience, because we define science the way it is defined now to be pseudoscience, leading with superstitions, like Professor Duwola Inka, Vice Chancellor of the University of Ibadan, kept saying it. Oh, let's move on. Let's move on to where? To the second industrial revolution. Now, this is also known as the technological revolution. And that happened when we had steel, when the steel was invented. Those of you in chemistry, you know the best of our process uh, to produce steel. So that was when the second industrial revolution started in 1870. It ended at the beginning of the First World War, 1914, characterized by rapid standardization and the movement towards globalization of in good, uh, at good pace. So what are the features? Iron and steel, as I said, the rail system. You can see, look, uh, let me give, let me just digress a little bit. While I was growing up, when I was, when I entered primary school, primary one, I didn't like school at all. I didn't like school at all, first two years. So what I would do, when my parents, they give me my, I take my slate, and uh, they, they discharge me to go to school, what I would then go, I, just in Ikeja here, I mean Lagos, I mean Ikeja and Lagos. Uh, we're living in Agege. So we would go on the rail line, and I mean, not, not that we'll go, I will not go to school. I will come on the rail line, I will walk from Ikeja uh, to Agege, I'll just keep roaming the, the rail line. And uh, when I see other students close from school, I will then go home. My parents will ask me, How was school today? Oh, school, very, very nice. What, and what uh, excited me was the train driver, a small man here, driving something very, very long. And ladies and gentlemen, my, my career, what I was looking forward to when I was in primary one was to be a train driver. Oh, yes, train driver. But I thank God I don't be a train driver today for the two for two reasons. One is that in Nigeria, all the trains don't no, no, I mean, except now that we are reviving them. I would have been out of job. And also, second one, if I was not out of job at that time, in a little while, I'd be out of job because these trains would be driven without any human being. You know, uh, drive, uh, moving them. So you have machine tools, paper making, petroleum, rubber, automobile, and all of this. These were features of the second industrial revolution. Now, where was Africa during the second industrial revolution? Well, not too bad. By 1900, 
<laughs> bad, bad, bad. I said not too bad, but I just did it with the tongue in my cheek. The whole of Africa, these people, these seven European powers, Britain, France, Germany, Belgium, Spain, Portugal, and Italy, scrambled for Africa. They're dividing us. Britain, Ghana, and Nigeria, we are here on them days, Britain. Uh, Burundi, Belgium. Uh, France, DRC. I mean, so they just divided us. So slave trade for cheap African labor was pervasive in to industrialized countries. And uh, we had rudimentary agriculture. We had science and technology, but we failed to grow. Western education began, and of course, tradu medicine flourished. Let's move on now to the third industrial revolution. That started in 1969. Many of us here in this class were born in uh, 1969 to early 21st century. As I said, 2020 is 21st century. So early 21st century will mean 2010 or even around now. So that's the third industrial revolution, which came about, was brought about by improvements or invention of semiconductors, mainframe computing, personal computing, and the internet is a digital revolution. So new te technologies started to emerge, artificial intelligence, uh, big data, drones, ro robots, uh, Internet of Things, and 3D printing. As we heard, Web Professor your Charles uh, addressed us. So Africa is the third industrial revolution. Uh, my feeling is that science and technology are significantly picked up. Not feeling based on conjecture, but feeling based on empiricism. If you look at the literature in science, we are still doing fairly well, although we are still trailing. Now, African scientists, largely trained in the West, are making impressive impact. I quote a few from here. Professor Briggs, Faborode, Onoha, Shabadi, they are making impressive impacts. Now, STEM development, however, is handicapped by low investment in human capacity development. Handicapped by low investment in research and development. Uh, although our universities that are supposed to be nurseries for producing STEM experts are very poorly resourced. I was executive secretary of the National Universities Commission, funding federal universities and regulating other universities. Uh, 2001, that's about 19 years ago. And I know very clearly, even till today, that our universities are poorly resourced. When I say Nigerian universities, the same is true of all African universities. Industries still hugely depend as hugely dependent on machinery from Europe, North America, and China. So you want to set up an industry, for so no, I want to set up an, in, uh, uh, an industry. We're looking for machinery from Europe or North America and from China. And our mineral exploration, Professor Noah gave us an exciting presentation, also Professor Ola Inka, on mineral exploration. Still largely in the hands of expatriates, who are stealing us blind in the process. And our leaders are pocketing the peanuts that they hand out to them. And sadly, this stolen money, instead of being used in Nigeria, is stashed in Western banks. So that's double jeopardy. I hope uh, Professor Harale will allow me to use that expression. So that, but things are not all the all the way bad. Let's look at some bright spots. In Nigeria, I'm just going to give a few examples. In Nigeria, we had the launch of the Nigeria telecommunication satellite, this one. And the Ebola vaccine, we, we worked on it. Our center of excellence in uh, Redeemers University, Ebola vaccine. We have notable efforts in biotechnology, nanotechnology, renewable energy, space research, traditional medicine, a lot of efforts, a lot of bright spots. We are locally assembling pieces, Zynos, uh, Omatech, uh, Omatech is coming down about Zynos. We are locally assembling pieces. We are locally assemb assembly, uh, assembling buses, Okada. Our members of Academy of Science under the leadership of uh, Professor Mostonua, Academy of Engineering, Academy of Education, and other scholars are conducting pockets of research to solve local problems. So don't let anybody deceive you that we're not doing anything. We're still doing, but we're doing a lot, but we can still improve on uh, our efforts. Let's go to Burundi. I'm, I'm, I'm recording 
in, in a number of uh, people in the room, Nigeria having the most, then Burundi. There's improvement in agricultural production, especially coffee in Burundi. And STEM research by scholars at the University of Burundi is coming up quite well. We have two new rice varieties have been introduced. I, I, I just checked this. And members of the Burundi Academy of Sciences and Technology, led by its president, Professor Juma Shabani and other scholars, are conducting pockets of research to serve to solve local problems. Of course, if you go to Bujumbura and around, you find small tech startups that are locally producing ICT gadgets. Let's go to DRC. We have significant achievements in agricultural research to improve yield of staple crops. Rapid Ebola testing methodology been invented. Rapid advances in travel medicine. Local production of efficient solar panels. Now let's come to Ghana. Ghana, my great country, second home. Local production of computer hardware. You see, when I go to Accra and I look at all the startup companies, I find them producing hardware and software to enhance commerce, governance, education, and science and technology research. Ladies and gentlemen, we have intensive efforts at improving agri-production in Ghana through locally manufactured machinery and development of new farming technologies. Ghana, unarguably, is the first country in sub-Saharan Africa to launch a cellular mobile network in 92. In January 2013, Ghana was ranked as the country with the highest mobile broadband penetration in Africa. Now, this is a quote I'd like to share with you. Ghana does not have to invent the technology for industry by carrying out research and development, but can adopt foreign technology from technologically advanced countries and relatively. You may wish to read this, quite, quite instructive. I want you to please note that the first industrial revolution used water and steam power to mechanize production. The second one used electric power to create mass production. The third used electronics and information technology to automate production. You can see changes, revolution, trends. Now, a fourth revol industrial revolution is building on the third, the digital revolution that has been occurring since the middle of the last century. Now, this is characterized by a fusion of technologies that is blurring the lines between physical, digital, and biological space. So, happening right now is the fourth industrial revolution. And uh, it's often referred to as Industry 4.0. Now, what is it about? The fourth industrial revolution represents entirely new ways in which technology becomes embedded within societies and even our human bodies. Examples include genome editing. You can see you want something, you want a child that is uh, tall or that is uh, an athlete. Just look for the gene and edit it. New forms of machine intelligence. Breakthrough materials and approaches to governance that rely on cryptographic methods such as blockchain. So imagine trends. Fourth industrial revolution. Artificial intelligence is all around us. From self-driving cars and drones. Drones are everywhere now. To virtual assistants and software that translate or invest. So your, my, my Microsoft Word that I have on this machine, even yours, just activate the uh, voice recognition and just speak. I will type the thing for you. And if I can tell my machine, shut down. Just say, shut down. It will shut down itself. Digital fabrication technologies are interacting with the biological world on a daily basis. Engineers, designers, and architects are combining computational design, additive manufacturing, materials engineering. You see, all of this that time will not permit me to uh, reel out. So what's the story so far? First industrial revolution with STEM. As I said, the four of them are coming together. I've not separated them in this presentation to say this is what science is doing, this is what technology is doing, this is what engineering is doing, this is what mathematics is doing. Because all of them are interplaying in, in the revolutions. First, second, third, fourth. So when I overfly a country, when I overfly the capital of a country, I take a plane. And I'll fly uh, Bujumbura, or I'll fly Lagos, or I'll fly New York. I can easily know whether that country is developing or developed. You see, the, the <laughs> from the sky, you see a developed country 
from the sky, you see a developing country. So what's the difference between the two, by the way? So <laughs> the developing country is one, uh, <laughs> the developed country uh, has an, an effective rate of industrialization. And individual income is known as developed country. That's what that developed country is about. Developing is a country which has a slow rate of industrial, industrialization and low per capita income. Employment is low in developing countries, quite high in developing countries. Am I hearing what you are hearing, or am I seeing what you are seeing, that African countries are here on this side? If rates, if a mortality rate, uh, Daddy Professor Numi Briggs will come in here, death rate and birth rate low, relatively, while the life expectancy rate is high. Go to Japan, you see 92 year old moving about. Come to Nigeria or African country, you see the 50-something-year-old almost uh, crumbling. High infant mortality rate, death and birth rate, along with low life expectancy. Living condition, good year. Well, moderate year. I got this from this. This is the source of this. So, generates more revenue from industrial sector here, here, service sector. Growth, high industrial growth. This ones rely on the developed countries for their growth. That's what I said. You want to manufacture, you want to purchase equipment, go to any of the industries in this Lagos. Many are around me here, Barawe Estate, but the machinery, all from overseas. And when a small diode, any small guide, any small thing goes wrong, they have to fly somebody from there. Because the, the man, who, the white man will not tell you the inside inside of how to solve this problem. Start of living is high, start of living is slow. Distribution equal, this one grossly unequal. The people, very, very rich. The other people, the large, 30%. Now, nah, just there for the bottom there. So where are we now, ladies and gentlemen? We are talking about the first, the second, the third, the fourth. So we are talking about the fifth. Are we in the fourth or in the fifth? Now, you notice that there were nearly two centuries between the first and the second. We are now living in either the third or fourth. Or depending on who you talk to, we may be on the cusp that's moving on the towards the fifth industrial revolution. With you can say this code five IR, the abbreviation, fifth industrial revolution. It's so new that experts across the world are scrambling to define exactly what it will be. Some people say it will be AI revolution, some say potential quantum computing. Uh, some are saying that when humans and machines combine in the workplace, that's what the fifth industrial revolution would look like. So, in this fifth industrial revolution, humans and machines will dance together metaphorically. At Davos last year, an event sponsored by Forbes, I got this from somewhere, that with blockchain plus AI plus human, the magic, there'll be all manner of ma magical performance here. So, as I mentioned in one of my statistics uh, lessons, I said, look, you as a PhD student, you don't have to go nowhere. Just say, look, get me the data, SPSS, analyze this thing. And SPSS will analyze. I said, I want MANOVA here, I want MANCOVA here, I want T-test here, do postdoc analysis, and it is done. Print this thing here, and then for your project, you don't need to be writing anything. Just speak to your, speak to your computer. Talk, uh, read your, I mean, just read to it, speak to it, and it will keep typing. So, uh, in the end, let me speak this. Let me skip this. Oh, let, let me take it. I say in the end, it all comes to, to, down to people and values. We need to shape a future that works for all of us by putting people first and empowering them. What are the prospects? What are the prospects for Nigeria? The prospects are very, very bright, but leading only in theoretical positions, in papers, in policy documents, in visual statements. Look at this. Uh, for Nigeria, formulation, monitoring, and review of national policy on science, technology, that's what we want to do. Acquisition and application of science, technology, and innovation con contributed to increase agricultural and livestock productivity. That's what we want. Increasing energy reliance through sustainable research and development in nuclear, renewable, and alternative energy sources. These are the things that Application of natural medicine resources and technologies for health sector development. Those are the things that we want. In Nigeria, what about in Burundi? 
There is a strategic plan which targets eight priority areas for science, technology, research, and innovation. In Burundi, this latest document, Burundi wants improvement agro-food technologies, medical sciences, energy mining and transportation, water desertification, biotechnology, material science, information and community, social and human sciences. That is what Burundi wants. What about DRC? DRC will want that through Vision 2025, uh, diversification and modernization of the economy, uh, which is heavily dependent on oil and development of secondary and tertiary education to provide the necessary skills base. Ghana. Ghana, uh, I, I, I'm sorry, I missed that bit. Uh, let's look at, uh, Ghana already mentioned something about it. Now let's look at the African Union, taken together. We have five-year science, technology, and innovation plan of action. By the way, for the Ghana one, uh, the next presentation by Professor Jofus Anama Mensa, who is the leader in STEM education, will be giving you all the details. So for Africa, we have a five-year science, technology, and innovation plan of action, 2019 and 2024. Together, for STEM, let's take a look at the future. All of these vision statements that Professor Anama Mensa will tell us that I've told you for Ghana, that Professor Juba Shabani will tell us for Burundi, like uh, the DRC doctoral students will tell us, are all driven, the major drivers are the following, the major drivers. Political will, we need selfless leaders with vision, and a spirit of adventure. You see, the typical African man, I'm sorry, I use the word typical, not to say that everybody, the typical African man does not want to adventure. You see the white man, is adventurous, you find them go climb Kilimanjaro mountain. They will even come to Kenya to climb our mountain. They were adventurous. But we are superlatively timid. I'm talking about typical. I'm not talking about all. Love of country. We need love of country. These are the drivers of STEM at all levels. Don't blame your Adidas alone. We have to blame everybody. Not the love of country, not of self and your family. But most of us, love of self and family. The investment in science and technology infrastructure and research. The young lip service. Let me continue by saying that we have some Africa specific hindrances to stem as we look at trends. Value of hardly want to give. African man will hardly want to give. Go to our universities on endowments, they, they won't give. Go to Europe, North America, you find people donating to, to, uh, to, uh, to research, to development as endowments. African man will want to take, take, take. High level of corruption at all levels. Don't blame only our leaders. Oh, everybody from clerk in the office to head of department to dean, corruption, corruption everywhere. And they will misplace priorities. Encouragement for footballers rather than for scientists. You find that uh, a lot of money, somebody will, make, will have an invention and nobody will just give him, nobody will talk about him. But footballers, they will get houses, they will get land and all of that. And videos of African success stories. This is very shameful. In STEM will not be viralized. You won't find if if somebody uh, in Ghana invents a gadget or an app, uh, don't, they are not going to put it viral on, on the internet. Only videos with weak contribution to development. The videos of people who are new, people who are this, that's what you go viral. Africans. Now I'm sad to report that there will be some negative impact of COVID-19. I have uh, nine, nine minutes. I'll make it possible impact of COVID-19. There's high chance of regression of our progress by, in Africa. We are, owing, we are in a lot of debt. We are begging countries that we are owing to reduce the thing or eliminate whatever. Many will not. Many will just take a little of, of. So we are in debt. So the high chance of getting investment in science and tech, not too good. Well, I predict quick rise by other countries, quick rise after COVID-19. But in Africa, very slow rise. Uh, rise. So what's our journey so far? First, Industrial Revolution, 18th to 19th century. Second, 1870s to 1934. Third, 1980s. Fourth, 21st century. Fifth, 21st century. So this I got from a uh, fifth element group. That the highest that great men or women reached was not attained by sudden flight. While others slept, 
they toil away in the night. So my entreaty to us all, to Africa, is that we should wake up. My end note is that we can make it with better leaders and better followers at all levels. So I will now open up the class uh, for question and answer. So the floor is now open. If you want to take the floor, uh, just let me know, and I will uh, uh, write down your your name. Uh, Ibukun, yes, Ibukun is number one. Yes, who is next? Okay, Ibukun, you can take the floor. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, sir, for the presentation. Um, my question is that um, in this, the, the, in the fourth industrial revolution, sir, what is the hope for Africa? Because so many Africans believe that um, robotics is their robot is going to take over their work. Artificial intelligence is going to be doing the work for them, so they will not be relevant. There will be job loss and all of that. So, what is the hope? For Africa in the fourth industrial revolution, sir. Oh yeah, you just stand by, Bukun, because uh, I'm going to Bukun, because I'm going to ask you to answer that question, uh, because you are the leader of uh, Africa. You are uh, imagine leader of Africa. Yeah, I can see. Yes, any other? Uh, another just sir. Uh, no, not yet. Uh, we'll take uh, David from DRC. We'll yes, Professor. No, no, not yet. I, I just told you. We we'll take uh, Joseph. Okay. Please, just give me one minute. Let me be sure something is happening here. Yeah. yeah, we we'll take uh, Joseph. Yes, who else is coming on? Uh, Faith Ibu. Yes. Uh, the Fonse. Yeah, the Fonse. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. No, not yet. I'll call you. I'll call you when I'm ready. Yes, who else? Mm -hmm. Mommy, Deborah, Dairo, are you asking a question? You are not. No problem. Yes, or making a comment. All right. So let's go. David. I want to mean about the uh, political leaders and the corruptions in Africa sure. against the scientists. You see, nowadays, we have a challenge in all Africa between political leaders and scientists. How many scientists are well paid as the footballer, for example? And nowadays, we have COVID-19. No footballer can mean, can give us uh, an opportunity as an answer for this uh, virus. And our leaders, uh, as the hospitals, as we make uh, infrastructure for hospitals, we don't have. You see, there is a problem between scientists and political leaders. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, we made a note of that. Uh, Joseph, <laughs> Joseph, if you're... Uh, Joseph, uh, thank you, Professor uh, uh, Mandy. I can see your note. Yeah, Joseph is not ready. Faith Ibu, take the floor. Faith Ibu, take the floor. Thank you so much, um, Professor. Um, as usual, your lecture is very engaging and calls for calls on the heads to think big. But I'm a little bit rather challenged because um, I'm a little concerned for the generation, the younger ones. Because I have kids that do not want to associate with African it calls for um, concern. Con it calls for concern for me. But I'm other concern, my kids will tell you they don't want to be Nigerian. They talk about other countries. Because they're obviously saying. Now down to what it just the presentation you just made. Yeah, you just give me a minute. Let, let me just thing. thank uh, Professor Fabrodi for coming. He said he has a, a session at eleven o'clock somewhere. Thank you, sir, Professor Fabrodi. Please go on, uh, Faith. <laughs> All right. I'm looking at um, where you talked about misplaced priorities. Like when I was growing up, I actually saw myself as going to be great 
I'm going to own a, a company that will manufacture. But the way forward, we really have, I quite agree that we really have a misplaced priority, priority rather. But just like you said, we cannot um, fault the government, it's the, um, the followers as well. What can we do? I'm already answering because I'm thinking as I'm asking the question that if we can collaborate, we can't just keep waiting for the government to do this for us. We can't keep waiting. When you look, when I look at the slide of the developed nations and the develop, um, developing nations, and I look at Nigerian, for instance, African, for instance, it's a rather shameful thing to me. I call, I'm an African. I want to go out there and boast that I'm an African. I can stand tall. That All my right. nation is. Uh, can you, my, my uh, is can you summarize now? Yes, can okay, you I'm summarizing now. Yes, Sorry, okay, no your problem. lecture just got me into this mood. Yes, good. So what I'm thinking is, this misplaced uh, priority, what can we do to address it? Just All like right. you said, we can't lay fault on just government. What can we do? Yes, yes. thank you very much. Uh, I, I can still see that uh, Professor Mike Fabrode is there. Uh, one yes, or two sir. comments from you, sir. Professor Mike Fabrode. Uh, Thank you, sir. I've already made my comment that the lecture is quite inspiring, and uh, I think it's uh, going to be useful in subsequent lectures because we have provided the general background. Thank you so very much, sir, and uh, all, you, the, sir. all the very best. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, yes, it it does. Uh, it it does. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm, yes, please uh, take the floor. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, sir, for this time. I'd like to thank you, professor, for uh, your lecture very, very exciting. And uh, my question is about uh, where is Africa and uh, what do we need to do to, to get where we need. So when we analyze uh, the, the generation the revolution, initial revolution, we see that uh, we are facing, the, the world is facing the uh, revolution, but in Africa, in many countries of Africa, we don't see a, any uh, revolution. We are not, we are not at the first, nor at the second, third, or fourth. So <laughs> I, I am. I want to know where do we need to begin? Yeah. Do we need to begin from the first? <laughs> go, 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 go. <laughs> but do we need to continue with the European <laughs> from the, the fourth? It's possible. Okay. So I don't see where we need to begin. Yeah, thank you so very <laughs> much, uh, in the phone. Uh, there's this concept known as uh, leapfrogging. Anyway, I'll come to that while, uh, while, while I'm uh, responding. So let me quickly respond to the people that have uh, raised questions or made observations. And uh, David, you talk about the scientist and the politician. Uh, the moment we keep, or so long as we keep electing square pegs and round holes as political leaders, then it will go on forever. They will, they will keep subjugating, not recognizing the scientist who is making efforts to produce the vaccine for COVID-19 in Africa, Africans, African scientists. And we want to remunerate the footballer and all these other people more. So until that day, we're done. But I'm sad to observe that it would be difficult for that to happen. Fredawa and uh, Francis and I were discussing, uh, I think, yesterday. And I said, look, the politicians are a little bit smart. They want to keep the people who will let them into power to be poor and, and so that by giving them five naira or five CDs or something, they will come and vote for them uh, so that they will keep maintaining that, that position that they are. So, so long as we have poverty in Africa, so, la so long as we have high level of illiteracy in Africa, David, I'm so sorry that uh, the challenge that you raised about politicians and scientists will hardly be uh, tackle. Joseph sent a, a message, but I, I, I'm not sure I got that. Faith, uh, Madam Igbo, oh, you are very right. Not only your children, many children out there are very concerned about being Nigerian or about being Ghanaian. Indeed, many parents will want to go and give birth 
to their children in the US or in the UK because of the doors that it will open. Because having been born here, it will close many doors. So you have answered the question, collaboration among us all. We need to collaborate. We need to pull efforts. We need to pull resources to be able to get better leaders there and also be better uh, followers. In the funds, you talk about where are we going to are we going to start from the first? No, we are not going to start from the first. We keep leapfrogging. We keep you know there's a quote that I didn't uh, have time to show up, to show when we the Ghanaian one. He said, look, all we need to do is to see where the others have gone and meet them there and then develop our technologies to climb on top of them. So that's the concept of uh, leapfrogging. Uh, I'm sure, you know, I said Africa will claim the 21st century. The 21st century is still early. This is 2020. We have 80 more years. Why I'm saying so is because we have a group of doctoral students here in this room today that will change the whole thing. I'm sure I can hear yes in your mind. I can hear you, you are saying you, are, you agree with me. So you go out there. That's the object of this meeting, of this lecture, uh, of this our uh, interaction. So you go out there to change the whole thing. But let me tell you that all the things I showed on that slide, which are hindrances, are values of not wanting to give. Africans who want to give. Are values of corruption. In fact, our children and their children will get more corrupt. I'm telling you that. They are going to be more corrupt. They have sophisticated corruption than us. So we just keep praying to God to be able to guide us there. Uh, we have two more minutes for this class. Uh, let's see what else. Okay, that, 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 will be, that will be it. So let me thank you all, uh, one and all, for uh, being part of this lesson. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a lesson for reflection. Where, what have we done? We have looked at trends in STEM development and have anchored it on revolution, industrial revolution. Look at the first, second, third, fourth, slash fifth, and where Africa is standing or sitting. Unfortunately, Africa is not standing or sitting. Africa is, is lying down and snoring. So, in the next couple of presentations, we'll be hearing from Burundi, no, from Ghana. Professor Joe Fusarama Mensa will tell us what STEM is, how STEM is growing in Ghana. Professor uh, Juma Shabani will tell us about Burundi. Professor S. Pitik Bamanja, who is already here in the room, will tell us about Sierra Leone. So, I'm going to go in that sequence. All I've done here is to put a regional framework, sorry, a global framework and a regional framework into the picture. And I've concluded on the note that the world is moving, Africa is also moving. But Africa is moving at too slow a rate to guarantee us a position in the Committee of Regions or of Nations. And the impediments are known. Don't let anybody deceive you to say, uh, come and tell us why the things wrong with Africa. We all know, all of us sitting here, we all know what the challenges are. And we all know the solutions. But the shame of it is that when people like you, I just pray it doesn't happen. When people like you get into positions, all of these things we are talking about will just be like theory. And you will get into the same kind of challenge we are blaming our leaders for. So on this note, I'd like to draw curtains. Uh, on this uh, this lecture and uh, I will very quickly as I end this I will then just give me one minute to wrap up this session and then I will take on Professor Jefferson Anama Mensa to give us the perspectives from Ghana. Once again thank you all so very much. <laughs>